Today's program is called Artificial Intelligence, How Smart Is It Really? Eric J. Larson. Let me read you his bio, a little bit about him. He is the author of the myth of artificial intelligence. He is a computer scientist and tech entrepreneur, the founder of two DARPA-funded AI, start AI startups, He's currently working on core issues in natural language processing and machine learning. Larson has written for The Atlantic and for professional journals and has tested the technical boundaries of artificial intelligence through his work with the IC Squared Tech Incubator at the University of Texas at Austin. Let's welcome Eric Larson. <laughs> Hello. So, um, so I'll tell, I'll talk a little bit more about how I came to write the book. I suppose I work in the field, so maybe it's a little odd that I um, wrote, a, wrote a book calling what I do a myth. Um, <laughs> you know, and my, you know, my, it, my colleagues, um, some of my colleagues are have similar intuitions and. Um, other of my colleagues disagree with me, some quite vehemently. So, so it's an interesting project to take on as a, a practicing computer scientist. Um, so I've been doing computer science for about two, 20 years, actually almost exactly the 21st century, 22 years. My first job was January 3rd, 2000. And I worked for a company that's kind of famous or infamous called Psycorp. Um, and they are, I pejoratively refer to them as the company that's trying to build a giant brain. Um, what they're doing actually technically is building a large knowledge base by uh, using a structured language, um, something called first order logic, to basically describe everything about the world. So the founder, a very brilliant guy, originally from Car Carnegie Mellon, had the idea that the reason we don't have true AI is because like, computers just don't have enough common sense. So the idea was to imbue computers with common sense by basically spoon feeding them knowledge in a language that they can interpret, parse, and understand. So I was one of the engineers that worked on that project out of graduate school uh, in Austin, Texas. Um, um, I was doing, I was actually working, doing a master's in philosophy at the time at UT, and I ended up going on to do a PhD and got more involved in, the, in computer science. Um, so we had, we hit a bubble, uh, the NASDAQ hit 5,000 that March of 2000, and everyone thought that we were going to finally realize the, the promise of the web. And AI was a big part of that picture. And then roughly a year later in 2001, uh, <laughs> the, the NASDAQ plummeted several thousand points. And pretty much, and they called that the big dot-com crash. I mean, for people who are old enough, you'll remember that. Uh, for people who read history, you'll know of that, um, regardless of age. So, um, uh, I switched fields from doing work on very large knowledge bases to working on um, tools that we used to call them empirical methods, but they're basically machine learning tools, it's like teaching a, teaching a computer um, how to do certain things, usually fairly simple things. But since the web was giving us, even though the the main Web 1.0 companies had all crashed. The web itself was still experiencing exponential growth. So um, Google was a very small company in 2000, but by 2003, it was all of a sudden quite a large company. So you, we, the, the dot-com crash was relatively short-lived. And suddenly we had all this unstructured data, uh, namely web pages, that we could use to build uh, what's called models using machine learning techniques. 
So I switched to doing machine learning stuff, and that kind of became the tip of the spear for um, artificial intelligence research. And it wasn't long before the, everyone in the field, the media, the public, were wondering how, what the new generation of AI technologies was going to look like. Um, and so I think it was the year 2005, this guy named Ray Kurzweil uh, published, a, he, he's a fu futurist, I think he now is director of engineering at Google, he has quite a nice um, gig at, at Google. But for, he was, he's known mainly for, for writing a series of books announcing the coming of artificial intelligence. And he puts the year quite consistently at 2029. So in 2005, I'm in, I'm in Austin, I'm working as an, an AI scientist. Um, and the singularity is near, his book comes out. And it makes a big splash predictably. And the public starts talking about when are we going to have self-driving cars? When are we going to have voice activated uh, conversational assistants that actually understand what we're saying? You know, when, when are we going to have robots that, that um, you know, can, can clean the kitchen, and help with the house, and actually navigate dynamic environments like that? Um, and so, you know, that discussion started in earnest again in 2005, and, and it was about that time that I decided, okay, I'm going to write a book and basically pour cold water all over this. <laughs> Uh, not not the, the very possibility of it as a, you know, in the space of logical possibilities, but as something that is inevitable because we're already on this path to AI, right? And so that's how typically how the discussion is, is you know, proceeds among futurists and enthusiasts is that, you know, it's just a matter of time. You can see that we're making steady progress. And so if you just sort of, you know, roll the tape forward um, at some, maybe you can't precisely determine, but at some time in the future, it's obvious that we're gonna, we're gonna have, uh, you know, really intelligent systems or what came to be called general intelligence systems or AGI, artificial general intelligence. And so, um, so I, I took issue with the inevitability thesis that we're already on this path and that it's just a matter of time. And, um, sort of the first thing I had to confront was, so when you, when you tell a true believer, AI sort of attracts people that have very strong opinions, pro or con. It's like, you know, it compared to cold fusion. Like if I told you I think cold fusion's not gonna happen anytime in your lifetime, I'm pretty sure you wouldn't throw anything at me. Like it would probably be okay. Unless you were working on, you know, cold fusion reactors your entire life and you, you have much invested. Most people don't get particularly passionate about other technologies that seem perpetually around the corner but never seem to arrive. But for some reason with AI, with my field, people have very strong opinions um, about um, whether it's, whether it's going to happen or not. And so um, I had to find a way of arguing the case that was both scientifically factual and also persuasive. Um, and so, you know, you, you hear discussions like, well, you know, a, a computer can never be conscious. And then you hear a response from the, from the futurist like, well, how do I know you're conscious, right? <laughs> like, so you just like, there's sort of these perennial philosophy 101 debates just rage on. Um, and I didn't want anything to do with that. Like I didn't, I wasn't interested in writing a book so that all the old arguments that have been trotted out over the last, you know, seven decades, um, you know, you know, so that we could rehash all those old arguments and I could get nowhere. Um, so um, <clears throat> what I decided to do <clears throat> was say, like, how could I draw the circuit, the circle, small, the, the smallest possible circle, so that the the argument is an a fortiori type of argument. If anybody knows. Uh, Latin, just like even stronger, right? So I'm going to say I'm only dealing with this aspect of cognition and intelligence. I'm not going to take on sentience, consciousness, whether they can have motivations, whether they, you know, uh, any, 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 anything in our mental, in our mental lives that isn't necessary other than problem solving. I don't want, I'm going to say is outside this circle. So everybody can keep arguing with that. But in this circle, I'm going to show you 
that computers can't think the way that we're thinking. And so the way I decided to do that was to use a, um, uh, this concept called inference. Um, and so inference is a very old idea. It has a few colloquial meanings like, you know, she's inferring all kinds of crazy things about you after what you said last night. Uh, that's not the kind of inference I'm talking about. Um, <clears throat> I mean the mathematical type of inference, um, and it's probably best understood as, given what I already know and what I can see, what is it plausible for me to conclude, right? So, you know, inferences, uh, we make inferences constantly. They're just, it's just ubiquitous in any cognitive system. Um, it's almost a condition of being awake that you're making inferences all the time, right? So you're having to make, everyone here that's listening to me is making inferences perpetually, just basically guesses as to what I mean, correct, correcting if in fact that went down some rabbit hole, right? Like your brain is doing all this stuff just to lock into a conversation so that the meaning passes from me to you. Um, um, so inference is just this ubiquitous thing and um, the question is um, what type of inferences do we do and what type of inferences are available um, when we design and build um, artificial um, intelligence systems. So there's basically three types of inference. Um, two of them you've probably heard of. They go all the way back to the Greeks. This is where for all any of the philosophers in the audience um, Deduction, if you'll remember, um, uh, modus ponens is probably the, the most, the, the most well-known. It's a, a, if A, then B, A, therefore B. So those are called syllogisms, very small. They were developed by Aristotle thousands of years ago. And they give you absolute knowledge. So if the premises are true, you know that the conclusion has to follow. So that's the beauty of, of deductive logic. Um, <clears throat> The problem, as I explained in the book, is that deductive logic is a very poor candidate for generating uh, artificial intelligence. Um, I'm not sure how much I'm going to get into the why, but it has to do with problems of relevance. So you can construct very, um, uh, very large, complicated deductive systems, and they have no ability to capture relevance in the real world. The knowledge is all, all has to be absolutely true, like triangles have three sides and so on. So there's this famous example from the philosopher of science, Wesley Salmon, who says, you know, the man who explains that he didn't get pregnant because he's been taking his wife's birth control pills. An AI system would be more than happy to accept that as a logical argument because birth control prevents pregnancy and so on. Not catching the fact that men don't get pregnant and so on, right? So it's this, kind of, it's this kind of failure to capture relevance that's not part and parcel to the deductive mode of inference that makes it a, a poor candidate for general intelligence. Although I've worked on systems where the primary, um, if the choice of inference was, broadly speaking, deductive, and there are certain kinds of problems that the, they solve really well, but they don't scale up to the sort of general intelligence that humans have. Um, the, and, you know, as, you know, as a, a historical note, the field of AI roughly before the web, we call that kind of classic AI, it's sort of like before web, after web, <laughs> in the, right? And before the web, most of the approaches were deductive or their variants. So symbolic AI was a very big deal before the web. And then, I, as I mentioned, as we got more and more this explosion of, um, unstructured data from web pages, then all of the all these different types of approaches, um, statistical approaches broadly, started be coming into their own. And so that, the whole symbolic um, AI um, program sort of um, faded away pretty quickly, actually, um, after the year 2000. So, not deduction. Um, okay, so, Computers can, so let me put it this way, computers can use a deduction, but it's not going to get them anywhere. Or it's going to get them to the places we already know, and that's not enough. So induction, people understand induction usually, it's connected with the scientific revolution. Uh, if you know a little bit more philosophy of science, you might go all the way back to a, a man, Francis Bacon, which was I think the 1600s. 
But in fact, induction was also explored by Aristotle, so it's, it has its roots in antiquity as well. But induction is quite simple, actually. I think it was Hume, the, the um, famous uh, Scottish philosopher who might have been might have been Hume. If not, I'm claiming now that it's Hume, because <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I have. I, I'm, okay, it's it has a high chance of being Hume. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm an AI system. Uh, <laughs> see, it's like uh, the, so. You know, let's say that I keep seeing white swans. Right. This is the this is the classic exposition of induction. Um, and so every time I see a swan, it's white. And so I'm getting more and more inductive um, strength for the hypothesis that all swans are white, right? So it has a fundamentally enumerative mechanism so that the more examples, the more inductive support you have for the conclusion. So I say that every time I see this creature, it has property X. I've seen a thousand. I'm pretty sure that this creature just has property X. If I've seen a million, I'm even more sure. And so it turns out that there are black swans in um, Australia, and, which points out the folly of using induction solely or primarily as your mechanism for inference. It, it takes, it suffices that you just have one counterexample and you've completely negated the rule that you thought was true of the world, right? So all swans are white, it's your inductive inference. The observation of one black swan tells you that that in fact is wrong, right? And so uh, the AI we're doing today, the deep learning, um, um, all of the stuff under the rubric of machine learning, that's all inductive, right? Uh, it's, it's manifestly inductive because you have this data set, it's, it's based on prior observations where you put it in some, some structured database, right? Prior observations, the more data, you know, you hear about big data, that's like more white swans, right? You can see how this is, there's a lot of bells and whistles, but at the end of the day, that's induction. And induction is manifestly not able to get us to general intelligence. So now we basically divided the entire field of AI historically between classical AI, which is roughly deduction and, and its variants, and Inductive AI, which is roughly the modern era, including the AI that's on our phones and everything else, and neither one of them nor the combination of them gets us to general intelligence. Well, if this were the case, if this were all that we could say about logic, then it would be very curious that we make the inferences the way we do, but it turns out that we in fact succeed at making, you know, relevance-based inferences. But it turns out there's a third type of inference. Um, it's less well-known. It was first officially formalized by a scientist and mathematician and philosopher, sort of a polymathic figure named Charles Sanders Peirce. He was an American. Uh, he was probably the first American to get real respect from the scientific community in Europe. Um, so this was in the 19th century when he was working and, you know, basically people overseas thought that we couldn't write and we couldn't do science and we couldn't do math. <laughs> I mean, we being Americans. And Peirce actually won, I, I forget now what the award was, but he had, went to France and collected his award for proving um, the, the exact length of a, of a meter using light, some contraption. So the point is, is he was a very brilliant guy, but he spent a lot of time thinking about inference. Um, and he formalized um, abductive inference as, the best way to think of abduction is a kind of, as a kind of logical fallacy of deduction. So if you have A, R, O, B, or let's say, let's put words to these. Um, if it's raining, then the streets are wet, right? So if A, then B. Um, the, mo the deductively valid um, argument would be that um, it is in fact raining, therefore we know with certainty that the streets are wet. Uh, if you do something called affirming the consequent, you take the consequent, if it's raining, which would be the streets are wet, and you actually give that as the observation, right? So you say, if, if it's raining, the streets are wet. The streets are in fact wet. Um, therefore, maybe, possibly, perchance, it's raining. Maybe somebody just ran over the 
fire hydrant, maybe a you know tanker full of water is on its way to put out the 3,433rd fire in California <laughs> in the last week. Um, you know, like there's all kinds of ways that the streets could be wet, um, but, but the abductive inference only says the plot that it's plausible, given what my the causal knowledge that I have about the world is plausible that in this case I see I see that the streets are wet. It's plausible that rain could be the cause of that. So abduction is often um, is often the inference we use when we see an effect, and then we want we want to reason about the the plausible or operative cause of that effect, right? And so that connection between cause and effect gives it a certain a different feel. And in fact, like I said, if you try to force abduction, if you can you can formalize it as a logical form. I just did it. As a as basically affirming as a as a fallacy, but if you try if you so if you try to force abduction into one of the other inferences, it won't fit right. It, it ends up like a fallacy. So you can't reduce abduction to any induction or abduction. So they're called distinct, right? And pretty much all the re, all the inferences that we draw. I'm not talking about emotions. I'm not talking about falling in love. I'm not talking about having conscious states. I'm saying using your head to draw conclusions, pretty much all the inferences we do fall into that tripartite distinction. So you have an exhaustive, distinct set, and what do we know? We know that the kind that we need is abduction, but the kind that, that we know how to program computers with is not abduction. It's either induction or deduction and experience. So, um, so I think the conclusion I drew in the book was um, uh, we know we need abduction to get artificial intelligence truly intelligent, and we have no clue whatsoever how to program <laughs> abduction into artificial intelligence. So we are stuck. We're not on a road. In fact, we can keep doing big data to our heart's content, we are not going ever to get to general intelligence. Why? Because it's induction. And induction is manifestly not capable of getting general intelligence. So we already know we're not on this path, right? Yes, we're gonna play games that are, you know, we're gonna go from chess to, or checkers to chess to go and so on, but those are games. In terms of the, the really flexible general intelligence that we seek from these systems and that would merit or license us telling, you know, saying this is truly an intelligent artifact, that's not, it's not going to be possible to do that using <coughs> the methods that we have, using induction or deduction or any combination of induction or deduction. We have to have abduction, but that's where we have this mystery. That's, how, that's where we just don't know how to do it. Um, so I concluded in the book, okay, stop saying that we're on this path. Read the book. <laughs> and my colleagues read it with PhDs in computer science, and they said, yeah, that's right. You know, some, some, of them, some of them didn't like the conclusion, but accepted it. Some of them thought, yeah, that's something that needs to get out, you know, into the, into the broader public. The media needs to know about this and so on. But yeah, that's the conclusion. So it's not, so just to highlight this, although this should be in, implicit in what I'm saying. I don't know if it's possible. I know that we're not currently on the path. So what it's going to take is some sort of scientific revolution in effect so that we can sort of understand how to truly do causal reasoning or abductive reason, reasoning in a formal, you know, formalizing it by writing in code. And um, the only attempts that have been made over the years to do this have been miserable failures. Um, I worked for a while on a project called Abductive Logic Programming when I was in Texas, and that is um, what I call abduction in name only. Um, and it's, what it is, is it's deduction disguised as abduction. There's another version of this that also came out of the University of Texas by a very smart guy, by the way, um, who used something called a BayesNet, and that formulation formulation was induction disguised as abduction. So we, had, we, so we have another abduction in name only. And I don't want to bore you too much with details, and I don't know how much time we have. 
We have about 13 minutes. Okay. Then I'll bore you with more details. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or you can ask questions anytime you want. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, I'll just, I'll just say maybe a couple more things to hammer this home. Um, so the, one of the reasons, or probably the reason, abduction is so hard and will take such a conceptual revolution in the field is that the number of, remember when I said like it's raining, the streets are wet, the streets are wet, maybe it's raining. So you can think of that not just as a single thing, but as a set of possible at antecedents, right? So, and that set can be potentially infinite. There's a potential infinite number of ways or situations or scenarios that could have happened, some of them very bizarre, I'm sure, that where the street ended up wet, right? Like there's just all the kids were out playing with the super soakers. I mean, you could just keep going on and on and on. So in order for the, the abductive inference to work, the computer has to have a sensitivity to a selection of a potentially very large set of operative factors. And to do that, it really has to have causal knowledge about the world. It actually has to know how things connect, cause and effect, and what's relevant to what. And once you start getting into that, it just becomes unclear um, you know, what to type. Let's say you're writing in Python code. What do you type? <laughs> it gets pretty much that simple. I, I build systems for, they're called natural language processing systems. So, um, and, you know, um, um, <laughs> at some point, somebody's, we're going to have to actually specify how that, that, how that works. We don't have a theory. There's nothing in neuroscience yet. And there's, there's literally, there's just a, a, you know, a silence when you go to actually try to do a design for that kind of a system. We just don't have... We just don't have anything on offer. And it does suggest to me, frankly, I suppose this is the last thing I'll say, it suggests to me, frankly, that we may be, in spite of all the, in spite of all the enthusiasm and hopes and dreams for the field, we may just be, at the end, building a lot of killer drones and surveillance cameras, because that stuff seems to work pretty well <laughs> with big data, but the machines themselves are like idiot savants, right? So we need to be careful because it could be that the, even the attempt to make truly intelligent machines ruins the world with unintended consequences. But on the other hand, you know, I'm a scientist and I'm trying to push the limits of the field. So, but it would be good. It would be good if we could find, you know, we could make progress in the field without necessarily having to tie it to massive data sets, which is what we're doing now in induction. Uh, and it's slightly a separate issue. But yeah, so that's what I wrote about. The book was sold well. It's been translated into many languages now. It's coming out in paperback next month. Um, Harvard, be, having Harvard behind it was, has been really great. Um, you know, I mean, my editor at Harvard is fantastic and they were very supportive. It was my first book except for my dissertation. And, you know, kind of went really well. I ended up you know, like doing a lot of this stuff all of a sudden, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I, that's about all I have. I mean, I, I'd be happy to talk, take any questions. Thank you. Yes, I have a question. Mm. I mean, you think about this all the time. I'm thinking about it for half an hour, so. So you're trying to mirror our type of thinking I mean, with the induction and the deduction and abduction, that's how human brains work. Is, and I know this is, is it, do we need machines to think a different way, but how do we make them think a different way if we can't think a different way? Mm -hmm. I don't know if that question's making sense, but. You mean, how, like, how, in what sense can we not think a different way? Yeah, I just think it's, it's like machines need to think differently than us, maybe. They, what they can do is, different than how people can think. Maybe there's a whole way of thinking that our brains can't do, that maybe machines can, but how would we ever get machines to do it? Because then you can't think that. Yeah, sure. Just, you know, yeah. With that. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, there's that, that, that happened, that's starting to happen, right? So the, the machine, the, uh, there was a, um, a deep learning algorithm that discovered, I think it's called Hallison, which is a new anti, but, Biotic, and I mean, actually, there's hardly any 
real scientific results that have come out of AI. But this, in this case, it was able to basically see patterns. So the, the, there's something called feature engineering where the computer scientist basically says, like, I think these are relevant features, whatever the biological facts are, I'm not a, you know. And then they kind of set the, the machine loose and the machine found all these really bizarre patterns that turned out to be, constitute a new antibiotic that a person would never have seen, right? So there's, there, are, there are things like to flip the, the whole discussion, there are things that really fast computing does find, especially in terms of like, in pat, like in terms of finding patterns that we don't seem good at finding. It's just too much data, the patterns are strange you know, for our brains. And so there is that, so there's a possibility of some kind of synergy, right? Uh, where you know, the machines are actually augmenting our intelligence instead of replacing it because the things that they're doing well, we don't have to. And we're already doing this, right? Like, so when you use a calculator, I keep thinking about a calculator like a, this, you know, like, like it's 1975. <laughs> like, so when you use the calculator on your iPhone, <laughs> you know, that's what you're doing. You're augmenting your intelligence with something, right? So we already do that kind of. And so the opportunities for augmentation, I think, are healthy. Um, and it, and they're, at any rate, they're not, it's, you know, it's going to happen anyway, right? Like, we're just not, nobody's going to put their phones down at this point and stop using. Right? Like, that's just not an honest answer, you know, to how, how do we deal with AI. It's like, it's everywhere. So, yeah, so I think that's, that's right. Um, and and I, I don't know, I mean, the, I had a question yesterday from the CS guys saying, well, can't we just look at the brain more? And can't we just figure out how, you know, how we think and then we can just put that. And that's, that sounds good on paper, but it's turned out to be an incredibly difficult problem of trying to, you know, figure out how we are intelligent and then translate that into code. So that, that yeah, it remains to be seen whether that really is a fruitful approach, but yeah. Thanks for your question. I probably didn't answer it, but I just answered the question I feel like answering. <laughs> like, you can say anything you want, right? You know, really, honestly. And I'll just say whatever I feel like. Yeah, I want to talk about this. <laughs> so I've been on the boring side of IT for 40 years. Um, and I, I wonder what your experience is. I love it. Like, you know, an automated chatbot. And I laugh. You know, I'm like, why do these people in leadership think we're going to have effective customer service that's automated? I mean, as soon as you deviate from anything that's not inductive, as you would say, it becomes it all falls apart. Yeah, and that's you right. Talk to a person, and I would bet everyone in this room has caught, you know, call on the phone and talk to the machine, and finally, I, I need to talk to a person. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But there is so much momentum out there for this idea, and people are spending thousands of thousands on it, and it's people that are supposed to be able to think. Even the IT community is, a, is all wrapped up in this today because it pays their checks. I don't know. I, I feel like a pariah because I'm going, why are we doing this? This is dumb. Yeah. Right? Until we have something, a better mousetrap. So I guess I want to know what your experience is being kind of a pariah or the guy going, hey, wait a minute, this doesn't really make sense. In face of all the momentum that's out there, like, oh yeah, we're gonna get there, it's all great. Yeah, I mean, I, there's a, there's a, I'm kind of um, siloed a little bit. I work for a, a tech company in Texas. We do a lot of work with the Department of Defense, Air Force is one of our customers. And in those contexts, like, I'm actually just trying to build them a system that works to solve the problem, whatever their pain point is. And so I actually don't see a lot of the, you know, the, the book type stuff. I don't actually see that flow into my... So, so you kind of disconnect that and say, here, I'm saying this, take it for what it is. Yeah, I mean... You just, it, right? I can't change the world. Is that, you protect yourself in a way, right? Yeah, I mean, well, so I think where it enters in is in the organization, inevitably, there'll be someone who has a pet theory so there's there's a guy and he, I like him by the way not that he's here <laughs> not that he's he, but like the, the, he's a colleague of mine and he's quite bright and he wants to use what's called a computational ontology uh, uh, to basically provide more tacit knowledge to the system and it's one of those kind of ideas that you 
hope works, but in reality, when you do the performance metrics, it like really doesn't work. And there are simpler ways to do it that are more effective. But he's kind of ideologically attached to that as, as this kind of big AI idea. So every now and then I kind of, those discussions do arise in my, in my job where I have to say like, look, we need to actually verify that this empirically, like what's the precision and recall on this? You know, like what is this, what's this doing for the customer? And why don't we just do this in a simpler way? Um, so, so, you know, the true believers can, they kind of do get into the workaday world. But the, the thing about, the thing about sort of capitalism, I don't know if capitalism is the right idea, but it, it tends to minimize that kind of st stuff because at the end over of the day, time, over time, it's yeah, it gets weeded out because you, you need, the system has to work, right? So those, but the chatbot is a good example of that getting forced on the customer where they're very frustrated. Some of those chatbots are quite frustrating, those interactions. And yet, you know, a decision was made that we're just using those now. <laughs> From you know, big companies just decided. Look, you know, we're going to cut our staff. You're going to start talking to that thing. It's got a it's got a nice, beautiful voice, and it's you know an IQ of 0.1, <laughs> and there you go, you know, and there we go. And so I think that's a great example. Um, you know, well, I mean, there's a lot to be said about that. You know, in terms of business decisions and AI. And so, but the AI, the, the original point was that the AI is not there, and that's absolutely true. The conversational systems have a long ways to go. Yeah. So I was watching a video not long ago, maybe you've seen it, with uh, Tony Robbins sitting down with a, you know, supposedly, I guess, AI robot or whatever, and having this conversation. Are you saying that uh, as far as programming, as I suppose would be beyond what you were just discussing, uh, they've only made so much you input into that, or you would get to a point where you would ask it a question that could be top knowledge, to, and it just wouldn't be like, uh, <laughs> yeah, go there. Yeah, what's the question? I'm sorry, what uh, has they, have they reached a point where uh, kind of like you said, they hit a wall, or and you, you realize that uh, asking this robotic question is just not going to be able to. Give the response for. Yeah, or it could give it could give the wrong response, or it could give just a completely zany response. Um, yeah, there's there's they're doing these standardized tests now. Stanford has one of them, and where it it basically reads a, like a children's story, and then um, you can ask it whatever question you want to ask, and it's in some cases it's remarkably accurate, in other cases it almost seems random. Right, like which is even which is even more frustrating. Like it got that right, but the very same type of question it has no clue about. Right, so but yeah, you do you definitely see that um, with the systems, and the, the core problem is that they don't understand the story. <laughs> right, like really, they don't understand the story. <laughs> so the statistics will eventually fail you because it's a house of cards. You know, yeah. I'm assuming we've also seen those those odd, very like scary paintings that these supposed AI yeah with this picture. It's like what is that? Yeah, I don't know. It, I, I don't know what they're trying to accomplish with that. Like it's like you know, is that supposed to be the evidence for a computer mind or just you know somebody's project after school after school project? It's like what what's what's that issue there? You know, I don't know. But yeah. You kind of made the argument this morning that at best we're going to get decent at deductive AI and that the inductive and the abductive are way, way in the future. Is there an argument to be made then that I work in youth development that education should be highly focused on? strengthening those inductive and abductive skills in our children and our youth mm -hmm. because those are the most durable and viable skills long term that will be replaced. Yeah, I think that's a good I think that's you can make that sort of argument. In fact I, I'm worried that as we offload expectation 
to machines to solve problems, we get less and less, uh, uh, you know, out of ourselves, right? So we're kind of creating a, we're kind of gutting out our culture. And I, I'm sure this, this could, this will have problems with education. And it might be actually that the, the you know focusing on the inference like abductive inference is distinctively human inference, and it's, it, it's tied in with innovation and discovery as well, right? Like so, when you abduce something, it might be oh, it turns out that the Earth, the Sun is actually at the center of the cosmos, not the Earth, right? Like that was a pretty big abduction that Copernicus made, right? And um, so, you know, it's really, it's like, it really goes to the center of what we mean by, you know, having a, a, a problem solving a culture and a culture that we're proud of, and, you know. And I think it's, it is important that that doesn't become a discussion about the future of machines. I mean, there's a kind of nihilism in that, right? Like, well, what should we do? Well, I don't know, the machines are gonna be smarter. I guess I'll go, you know, <laughs> I go, I don't, you know. It's a little, it's, it's somewhat strange, like, it's a, that, that kind of, that kind of science fiction when it becomes, when it actually gets, you know, it actually becomes a, you know, a, a working thought among, in the culture. Like, I think it, it does, it could have deleterious consequences. But I, anyway, I, I like your thought about you looking at, looking at the types of inference and then, like, have, actually making that some kind of pedagogical, you know, project. I think that's a that's a great thought. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. So thanks. Mm -hmm. Two more minutes. There's another question. Sure. I, I think about Alan Turing. You were talking about mm -hmm. that stuff too. My, I guess my definition of that would be really truly reach artificial intelligence when it's able to think illogically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There you go. <coughs> yeah, that's probably right. Did he say that? Did Turing say that? No, no, I don't, no, I don't think that's what he said. I think he just said, you know, when you're confused by, when you can't tell the difference between a computer and a human being, that's when it's... Yeah. But yeah, no, I, I was just thinking, if you can think logically, I think you can use artificial intelligence. Yeah, that's right. Or get jealous or something. Yeah. Yeah, then, yeah, that, that would be... That would be some kind of hallmark of, <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah, Turing, Turing sort of said that with the Turing test because that conversation could go anywhere, right? And so uh, if, if the machine was, I think he said at one point, if, if the machine is calculating seven digit numbers too quickly, then uh, we, don't, we don't think it's a person, right? So. It has to dumb. It has to be smart enough to dumb itself down, right? Yeah, yeah. That was a clever um, suggestion from Turing, the Turing test, the eponymous you know, Turing test. Oh, one more. Question. Sure. No. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. you.